Welcome back, everyone. We're ready to hear uh, Father Eric Anderson. So I'm just going to introduce him as uh, he's at St. Stephen's Catholic Church up in Portland and my old pastor in Old Parish. We're looking forward to hearing Father Eric speak. He's, uh, he has hosted the last two men's conferences at his parish, uh, and the last two. So he's been a great support. Uh, so let us uh, welcome Father Eric. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let us begin with a prayer. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti, Amen. May St. Joseph, the spouse of your most holy mother, be our aid of ourselves. Lord Jesus, we cannot obtain your grace. Please grant it to us through his prayers. This we ask of you, Lord Jesus, living and reigning with God the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God eternally. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see you. I see many familiar faces out there. And, uh, well, it's a beautiful day outside. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to pray for. And uh, St. Joseph is, is really just um, a perfect intercessor. So, uh, as I was preparing this talk, I thought, wow, nobody had taken the... Uh, Nobody had taken the title of the conference yet for their, for their talk title, so I thought I would go ahead and, and take that. So the title of this talk is St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. And in reflecting upon this, first I'm going to, um, first I'm going to tell you a little story from the life of St. Joseph. It is said that along the way to Egypt, Joseph was troubled by intense bouts of crying on the part of the baby Jesus. Well, Venerable Maria Cecilia Bai, who wrote uh, the book, The Life of St. Joseph, she reports that, this, that the, the bouts of crying, the intense bouts of crying on the part of the baby Jesus caused Joseph serious distress during their travels. He thought at first that the infant's tears must somehow be occasioned by some physical sufferings due to the cold. But he didn't realize that although Jesus was indeed suffering, Indeed, suffering considerably by these instances, his tears were occasioned rather by the sins of men. At any rate, she writes, Joseph felt disheartened, and he also began to weep, especially whenever he found Mary doing the same. And she made it clear to him, however, that she and the divine infant were weeping because of the offenses that were being committed against the Heavenly Father, and she furthermore prevailed upon Joseph to unite his tears with those of Jesus and thus to offer them up to the Eternal Father in supplication for the conversion of sinners. Joseph thanked Mary for her admonitions and thereafter he complied fervently with them amid copious tears. Well, Mother Maria Bai says that upon arriving in Egypt and as they entered the city, the idols to which these blinded people rendered their adoration, fell toppling to the ground. And this caused a considerable stir among the inhabitants, since no one had any idea what could be bringing this about. How could they know that it was the true God himself who was thus destroying their false gods as he entered into their city? And then Venerable Mary of Agreda also writes about this. She writes that when the Holy Family reached the inhabited country of Egypt, on entering the towns, the divine infant in the arms of his mother raised his eyes to heaven and raised his hands to the Father, asking for the salvation of these inhabitants that were held captive by Satan. And immediately he made use of his sovereign and divine power and drove the demons from the idols and hurled them to the eternal infernal abyss. Like lightning flashed from the clouds, they darted forth and descended to the lowermost caverns of hell and darkness, and at the same instant, the idols crashed to the ground, the altars fell to pieces, and the temples crumbled to ruins. Now, the cause of these miraculous events were known or the cause of these miraculous effects were known 
to Our Lady, for she united with her she united her prayers with those of her most holy Son as co-operatrix or operatrix of his salvation. Well, St. Joseph also knew this to be the work of the Incarnate Word, and he praised and extolled him in holy admiration. But the demons, the demons, although they felt the divine power, they knew not whence this power proceeded. They knew not where it came from. Well, Venerable Mary of Agreda continues her account. The Egyptian people were astounded at these inexplicable happenings. Although among the more learned, ever since the sojourn of Jeremiah the prophet in Egypt, an ancient tradition was current that a king of the Jews would come and that the temples of the idols would be destroyed. Yet of this prophecy the common people had no knowledge, nor did the learned know how it was to be fulfilled, and therefore the terror and confusion was spread among all of them as was prophesied by Isaiah. And there we have some accounts of the Holy Family entering into Egypt. Now you'll often hear about, you'll hear, uh, you'll hear the account uh, if you pray the uh, seven sorrows and joys of St. Joseph and the little meditation for each of the seven sorrows and joys. It mentions the toppling of the idols in Egypt. And you wonder, well, where does that come from? Well, it comes from here. Um, we have, uh, throughout, you know, throughout the history of the church, we have accounts like this that tell us, um, these little details. So you'll often see these types of details, these types of stories portrayed in art. If you go to a, you know, if you go to any of those great museums where they have collections of sacred art and you'll have all these stories that either come you know, from, from here or from the golden legend of Jacob is or some of the, uh, some of those other types of, of, of stories and legends that have been handed down. And it's good for us to know these stories um, as Catholics. It's good for us to know these stories so that we are, you know, that we're literate in the tradition. We know the tradition, we know the stories, we know the legends, uh, so that as we go and we you know, happen to be traveling and you go into a museum and you see, oh yes, oh yes, the toppling of the I idols in Egypt. Oh, I'm very familiar with that. And you're not thinking, well, what's going on there? I have no idea because I've never heard the story. It's good for us to, to know these stories. Well, Venerable Arch Archbishop Sheen comments on this as well. And he says, by his presence in Egypt, the infant savior consecrated a land that had been the traditional enemy of his people and thus gave hope to other lands that would later reject him. The exodus was reversed as the divine child made Egypt his temporary home. It's said that the Holy Family there was there for seven years. Seven years. Mary now sang as Miriam had done while a second Joseph guarded the living bread for which human hearts were starving. Those are the words of Venerable Archbishop Sheen. Yeah, we think about that. Our Lord, our Lord completes things in this, uh, brings things to fulfillment by either undoing what had been done uh, or going back to the scene of something and, and bringing it to completion. So we see that uh, here in, in Egypt. The exodus was reversed, as Venerable Sheen puts it. So, what do we see here? We see that the Lord's presence terrifies demons, and they flee and are cast into the abyss. So, where does this power come from? Well, the power is from God. I think we all understand that. But recall that Jesus is true uh, Jesus is true God, and he is also true man. And, he is, and it's good during this season of Advent that we just recall that he's one person with two natures, divine and human, not two people, but one person. One person with two natures. Now notice that, you'll notice in the story, if we look back, that he prayed to his Father in heaven. And he raised his hands and his eyes 
to the Father in heaven. This is an important point because the Father is the key, as we look to St. Joseph, as the terror of demons. The fatherhood of St. Joseph, then, is an important key to understand why he is the terror of demons. So let's just consider, uh, I'm, I'm presuming many of you out there are, are fathers, and so consider that as a father you have spiritual authority over your wife and over your children. You have spiritual authority over your sons until they reach the age of 18, and you have spiritual authority over your daughters until they get married, regardless of how old they are. So, uh, when your daughter, you know, when your daughter gets married, then you transfer that uh, spiritual authority over to her husband, which is why the father walks his daughter down the aisle and literally hands her hand into the hand of the man who will be her husband. That's a transference of that spiritual authority. Now, while this may uh, be a contested um, idea in, in our society today, the demons do not contest it. They know. They know that a father has spiritual authority over his daughter until she gets married, even if she's older. The demons know that. And they also know that once a boy turns 18, he has to, he has to take authority for himself. If, he, if he's still living at home, well, you know, he has to take authority for himself at that point. He needs, he needs to get his life started uh, for his own sake, because the father no longer has spiritual authority over him. But this, uh, this is really going to be a key to understanding why St. Joseph is the terror of demons. So all of that was a little bit of an aside, but it is important to making the point. What authority does St. Joseph have over our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, certainly he has authority over him as the head of the Holy Family, and at least until the boy uh, turns 18. But how do we understand that, that a man could have spiritual authority over God? That's... That would be a little bit more uh, confusing uh, for us to clarify. And uh, I, I can't tell you that I can clarify it exactly, but we can at least explore it. We can explore this idea. So what authority does St. Joseph have over Jesus, who is God? Well, first of all, let's just take a look at the fatherhood of St. Joseph. Oftentimes he's referred to as the foster father of Jesus. But, the, but uh, fathers and doctors of the church assert that he is the true father. He's the true father of Jesus. And that, that, takes a little bit of, uh, that takes a little bit of instruction for us to get there. So here's how we understand this. St. Joseph was a virginal husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Both of them were virgins. Their marriage was virginal. They did not exercise the use of their marriage. Their marriage was not ordered toward the procreation and education of offspring in the same way that other marriages are. And yet, there is a child that is the fruit of this marriage. There's a child that is the fruit of this marriage. The child is God, and he was made incarnate of the Blessed Virgin Mary, by her spouse, the Holy Spirit. So Mary is the spouse of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now Mary can only have one spouse. She can only have one spouse. So St. Joseph stands in the place of God the bridegroom in a unique way. However, it is similar to how every man stands in the place of uh, sacramentally, Every man who gets married stands in the place sacramentally of Jesus, the bridegroom, for his, for his wife, the bride. And the bride stands in the place of the bride of Christ, the church, sacramentally. So if we can understand that, then we can understand how St. Joseph then stands in the place of the divine bridegroom, 
of Mary. Now, Christ is the true bridegroom of every sacramental marriage. And, and we should understand that, that a marriage is not between two people. It's between two people and God, that God is the spouse and husband and wife mediate God's love to one another. The man stands in the, in the place sacramentally of Jesus, the bridegroom, and the woman in the place of the bride of Christ, the church. So St. Joseph then is truly her husband. But in a virginal marriage, because Mary can take no other husband according to the flesh. Mary can take no other husband according to the flesh. Having conceived already once virginally through the Holy Spirit, and she remains a virgin. So St. Joseph also remains a virgin. Well, the question is then, whose child is Jesus? Is Jesus only the son of Mary? Well, what then about St. Joseph? Is he the father of Jesus? Or is he merely the foster father of Jesus? Now, we can look at any mother and father and see that they cooperate with God to bear children. No mother or father create together. They do not create their children. Husband and wife do not create their children. Only God creates the child. Only God can create something out of nothing. Man can only procreate. He creates with God, cooperating with God. But God is the primary factor in the creation of every human soul. God alone can create a soul out of nothing. Therefore, God is the true creator of all children through the cooperation of their parents. Now, St. Joseph did not cooperate in the conception of Jesus, but he did cooperate in the fatherhood of Jesus as any man does with the children that are born into a marriage. St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary were married with the blessing and the command of God. Now, God took on human flesh in the incarnation. The marriage of Joseph and Mary was entirely ordered toward the incarnation. The purpose of their marriage is that it is ordered toward the incarnation. And there's no other purpose for their marriage. This according to Father Joseph Mueller. I think it's Joseph Mueller. Anyway, it's Father Mueller. Anyway, uh, he wrote the book, The Fatherhood of St. Joseph. This is an old book. But it's really, it's fascinating in speaking about how Joseph is father. So basically, this is coming, this is coming from him. So there's no other purpose for their marriage. St. Joseph is the virginal father of Jesus. He is not the natural father of Jesus. He's not the natural father of Jesus, but he's the virginal father of Jesus. Yet he did cooperate with God in the process. He didn't cooperate with God physically. He cooperated with God morally and spiritually through his own virginity. Now Mary conceived only by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit upon her. So she cooperated morally and spiritually in the conception of Jesus while retaining her virginity. St. Joseph became the father to the Son of God through obedience to God by entering into the marital contract. I hope this is really keeping you awake after a good lunch. Because I realize after lunch, I remember in college, my class after lunch, I would always fall asleep. So. Um, I, I hope, if nothing else, you get a really good nap out of today. <laughs> but uh, also, you know, this, this, this really engages the mind. And it might tire your mind that makes you fall asleep, or it might engage you and keep you awake. But you can always watch the video later. This is the type, this is the type of thing we just, oh, we should do that. Actually, this would make a great philosophy night. We have a monthly philosophy night at the parish. And uh, this, would, this would make a good one. Things that uh, really get your mind sort of uh, working. Okay, well, let's get back to our, let's get back to our, um, our teaching here. All right, so St. Joseph cooperated with God, not physically, but morally and spiritually through 
his own virginity as Mary did. Mary didn't cooperate physically in conceiving the child in the natural way, but she did cooperate morally and spiritually by saying yes. Right? She assented to that. And so by the marriage of St. Mary and St. Joseph, um, they enter into the marital contract, and that too provides for, for uh, the fruit of the marriage. So we continue with Father Mueller here. According to the well-known words of the Apostle St. Paul and the generally accepted juridical views, the body of the wife belongs to the husband with a view to procuring of new life. And the lawful fruit of the womb belongs not only to the wife, but also to the father, even if he did not cooperate physically in the conception. But St. Joseph did cooperate spiritually and morally by offering to God his own virginity and his own fidelity to guard and protect, to provide for his wife and his child, and to educate the child. Now, according to St. According to Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas and other great theologians, the virginal marriage between Joseph and Mary was ordained by God toward the incarnation of the eternal Son of God in such a manner that the child Jesus would be the proles or the offspring of this marriage. And it is generally agreed that the fruit of a marriage can, only, can be only a child who is the result of that marriage and to whose origin and existence, or to whose origin or existence, both husband and wife have cooperated in their respective manner. For as St. Thomas well says, a child conceived in adultery or a child unrelated to that marriage and adopted later is obviously, as all agree, not a proles, not an offspring of that marriage. But since the child Jesus is the proles, the offspring of the virginal marriage between Joseph and Mary, therefore, Joseph and Mary have both of them cooperated uh, to bring about the human existence of Jesus. The human existence. He is God from all eternity, but he takes on human flesh in time from the flesh of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So Mary and Joseph have both cooperated to bring about the human existence of Jesus. Not Mary alone, not Mary alone, but also Joseph, for what is done unilaterally by one spouse cannot be ascribed to the marriage as such. If, if a child... If a child comes about through one spouse, then it cannot be attributed to the marriage. Now, St. Joseph did not, again, cooperate as a physical cause. Therefore, it was a moral cooperation on his part. Okay. Father Mueller continues. Mary and Joseph cooperated by contracting their virginal marriage by their mutual, chaste, marital love. By their holiness, culminating their total obedience, surrender to God, and by doing so, they supplied the condition, or better, the disposition, by which God's all-wise, merciful decree, the incarnation of his Son in the purest womb of Mary, was irrevocably bound up. Just as in the natural order, the production of new human life is bound up with marital uh, the marital act. Thus the child Jesus, as the offspring of that virginal marriage, was truly the child of husband and wife of Joseph and Mary. And as Mary was the mother, so was Joseph. In a true sense, even if only analogously, he was the father. So, that's the first point we need to make. So Joseph... Uh, Joseph, then, we can truly call the father of Jesus, as, as he is called in, in the scriptures. When Mary and Joseph find Jesus in the temple, after three days lost, Mary says, oh, I forget exactly, but, you know, where have you been? Your father and I have been seeking you, sorrowing. And she refers to him as his father. Now, of course, then he refers to a different father, 
Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And, the, and she pondered over those words. But nevertheless, he went home, and we are told that he was subject to them. And so here's where, here's where we can start to understand why St. Joseph would be the terror of demons. Because our Lord Jesus Christ was subject to him. Well, let's look back at, uh, let's look back at Egypt then. As they were going into Egypt and the idols toppled and the demons knew not whence the power came. Whence is one of those uh, old words that means from where. Hence means, well, what does hence mean? Whence is from where, whither is to, to, to where. Whither, uh, whither thou goest, where, where you're going, or whence thou hast come, where in the past. It's good. These are good words. It's good to, it's good to use these words. So I was reflecting on this this morning, and I happened to be looking at this little bottle of holy oil from the, uh, from the um, what do you call it, the Oratory of St. Joseph in Montreal. And as you'll see, oh, by the way, hello to the people in the camera. I don't know how you all get in there, but uh, you'll see here a picture of St. Joseph. And this is a statue from the uh, Oratory of St. Joseph in Montreal. And you'll see here that Joseph is holding the baby Jesus in his arms. Is that okay? Does that work that way? Oh, okay. Well, here, you can zoom in on this. Well, anyway, just trust me. This, the, the statue has baby Jesus in his arms. Now, to look at the statue, you see a little child with a crown on his head. And then you see this big man with a crown on his head. And if you didn't know, let's just say that you were, well, let's just say that you were a, uh, um, well, a stupid demon. And you see this man with a crown, carrying this little boy with a crown. And then meanwhile, you're wondering whence this power has come. Well, you would look at this man and you think, oh, he must be a powerful man. Not knowing that it's the baby who holds the power. But nevertheless, this baby who holds all the power is subject to this man wearing the crown. Therefore, this man has spiritual authority that comes from the boy. And perhaps that would be the way we could understand this, that a father has spiritual authority over his sons. St. Joseph has the spiritual authority of his son. We could say that while his son is, uh, is a baby and while his son is uh, a minor. That's really, I think, the key to our understanding of St. Joseph as the terror of demons. You've probably heard that, uh, you know, praying the rosary. I'm sure Father Calloway probably talked about that today, that praying the rosary, or if he didn't, you know that he talks about such things. Uh, the rosary is, is known as a great weapon in the spiritual battle. And... Uh, and it is because Our Lady, having been conceived immaculate from the very first instance of her, first moment of her existence, that never, never for a moment was she subject to the devil. Never for a moment was she um, under his uh, control, under his power. And so St. John Vianney says that the Blessed Virgin Mary is invisible to the devil because she is immaculate. And uh, therefore, you're in, under a spiritual attack, or if, if you're wishing to uh, you know, put on the armor of God, you start praying the rosary. And, uh, and because Mary is invisible, the devil knows not uh, where she is, but he's afraid that his head's going to get crushed. So he flees. And that's one of the reasons why we understand that the rosary is such a powerful a defense in the spiritual battle. Now, St. Joseph is not immaculately conceived. We, we understand that Mary alone, in a unique way, is immaculately conceived in the first moment of her, of her existence. But there is a speculation 
And uh, there are certainly fathers of the church who have said that St. Joseph was, uh, while not immaculately conceived, that he was immaculately born. In other words, that he was, that he was sanctified in the womb like St. John the Baptist. Now, this isn't, this isn't Catholic dogma, and it is one of those speculative teachings, and yet uh, it, is, it is taught by some prominent church fathers. So it is something that can be speculated. It's something that can be debated, but is not defined. If that's the case, then, we could understand how the devil would be confounded by St. Joseph as St. John the Baptist, who was sanctified in the womb and born without original sin. You know, St. John the Baptist was, you know, a force to be reckoned with. We all know that. Or, I mean, well, if you don't know that, trust me. He was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, but I would guess that St. Joseph was too. And he's, and he's known as, um, well, in Ireland, he's referred to as the real quiet man. John Wayne was in that movie, The Quiet Man, filmed in Ireland with uh, Maureen O'Hara. And, uh, but St. Joseph, when he arrived, when he appeared at Knock, at the Shrine of Knock in Ireland, never said a word. In fact, no, none, of the, uh, none of the images there of Mary, Joseph, St. John, um, and the Lamb of God. It was, it was silent for hours, and, and, but they weren't as statues because they were breathing and they were moving as though alive, but they didn't say anything. So St. Joseph is referred to there as, um, as the quiet man, the real quiet man of Ireland. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have had the experience of... Um, you know, just getting that look from your dad that, you know, that knows that uh, something's going on and, and, and maybe you learn that all you need is that look to know that you better shape up. Well, uh, we can presume that uh, perhaps St. Joseph knows how to give that look and the demons know that they're in trouble. Well, let's continue then with uh, a comment from a, a great theologian by the name of Suarez on the, uh, on the verse, he was subject to them. Coming back from the temple, after having been lost for three days, and, the, and the, Mary and Joseph find him in the temple, he goes home and he's subject to them. This is what one of the great theologians by the name of Suarez has to say on this passage. This sentence signifies that Jesus actually did rather than what he was obliged to do. For, so in other words, he was obliged to be subject to them, as all children are, but that he actually was, as opposed to most children who sometimes are and sometimes are not. And, and I'm sure you know if you have children uh, what I'm talking about. Jesus actually did rather than what he was obliged to do. For in truth, on account of the dignity of his person, he was in the proper sense subject to no man. For to indicate, but to indicate the high position of St. Joseph, it was sufficient that Christ, considered only and specifically in his human nature and origin, was by right to be subject to him in his human origin, though exempt from it by his divine nature. He wished to be actually subject to him and to render respect and obedience to him as to his father and superior. So, can we understand that difference between the humanity and the divinity of Christ? That in his divinity, he is equal to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. In his humanity, he's inferior to his own divinity. And that's sometimes, I think, something... Uh, that can be a little confusing as we, as we read some of the scriptures and, and our, our Lord Jesus Christ is praying to the Father uh, as to his God. And uh, it can be a little unclear. Well, isn't he God? Well, yes, he's God. He's always in the presence of the beatific vision. But in his humanity, he's inferior to his own divinity. 
And we get that from the Athanasian Creed, that he is uh, equal to God in his divinity and inferior to God in his humanity. So with that in mind, then, in his humanity, he is subject to St. Joseph. He is subject to a man who is his father. In his divinity, he's not subject to anybody. All right, Pope Leo XIII writes, St. Joseph is distinguished above all others by that august divinity, which, I'm sorry, by that august dignity, which consists in this, that according to the divine plan, he was the protector of the Son of God, the Father of Jesus in the opinion of man. The natural consequence of which was that the Word of God humbly submitted himself to Joseph, obeyed his commands, and paid him all the respect the children owe to their father. Okay? Well, let's continue then back to Father Mueller. St. Joseph is seen to have a special relation all his own to God the Father. So earlier we spoke about how every husband stands in the shoes of the divine bridegroom, Jesus Christ. But St. Joseph, we would say, stands in the shoes of God the Father in a unique way. I mean, every, every, every dad is going to be looked upon, at least by his little ones, as having a godlike presence and status. If only, if only, they, would, if only they would always think that. <laughs> but, but they do think that when they're little. And it's very sweet as a priest. You know, the little ones, the little ones uh, will sometimes think that the priest is God because that, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a visual... Um, identification that they make, that man who's up there doing all this godly stuff. So, so children understand that, especially about their dads. This is why it's so important that children are raised by their father and their mother. It's really important that they have that complementarity of father and mother, just as our Lord is given Mary and Joseph, a father and a mother. And this is why it's not just enough for Mary to have the Holy Spirit as her spouse, but to have Holy, Holy Joseph stand in the place in, uh, of her spouse in, in that human, earthly way. All right, so again and again, messengers come to him with instructions and directions from the Heavenly Father. This is back to Father Mueller again. So the Heavenly Father himself sends instructions to St. Joseph by means of messengers, by means of angels. So St. So Joseph is seen to be the temporal, visible representative of the eternal Father. So the Father in heaven is eternal, but St. Joseph is a temporal representative of him in time. Not eternally, St. Joseph did not exist from all eternity, but in this time, he is a temporal and visible representative of the Father. Now, surely, uh, also Jesus and Mary regarded him as such a representative and therefore would render the most prompt and willing obedience to his wishes and commands. And thus, the paternal authority of St. Joseph is a reflection, a faint yet wonderful reflected image of the infinite authority of the Heavenly Father. Now, this was written in the early 1950s. I think today people have a difficult time with authority and obedience. We, we, we have a concept of it, but in reality, we have a very difficult time. And you might even ask yourself, well, why is it that all of these, uh, why, why is it that all of these kids are out there um, protesting? Well, they've been taught to do so. They're just doing what they've been taught to do. Uh, our, our school system, our family structures, uh, our media have, have taught them to respect no one, nothing, and to, to protest. They're just doing what they've been formed to do. And this is many generations in the making. 
Many generations in the making, of uh, generations that have been indulged, spoiled, um, and, and taught to be rebellious by rebellious parents. And this goes back at least, at least four generations, if, if, not, if not more. If any of you, have, uh, if any of you are familiar with um, Father Chad Ribberger, he has a great talk called The Sixth Generation. And he goes back through the last six generations talking about you know, each, what each has passed on to the next. And uh, anyway, it's a fascinating talk. It was based on an article he wrote in Latin Mass Magazine in 2012. But uh, to, to read it now, eight years later, you know, it's, it's just right on. And we could even say that you know, all the, the protests and everything that's going on today that we think is so incredible, uh, you know, we should have expected it. It's, it's, just been, it's just been in the works for a long time. All the more amazing to think of the obedience that our Lord gives to St. Joseph. All the more amazing to think about. And we really, we really should be cultivating that sense of obedience in our lives today, subjecting our wills to those who are our superiors. And subjecting our wills uh, for the good, like in a marriage, for instance. Uh, you know, husband and wife. Uh, understanding how to s subject your will to the other. For instance, and here's a good example. I mean, any, I think anyone can understand this. Let's say that you're, uh, let's say that you're driving someplace. And you know the best way to get there. You've driven it a million times. You know the best way to get there. You'll save three and a half minutes by going this way rather than that way. But then there's this scenic drive. It would take an extra hour. And, well, you really, you know, you really want to just get back. But there's no sin involved, whether you take the scenic route or whether you take the most efficient route. Uh, but nevertheless, perhaps your wife would like to take the most efficient route. And, and you really just want to take that scenic drive because you've had it at work, you need, some, you need a break, your wife wants to get back for something, or vice versa, you want to get back for something, and she wants to take the scenic drive, maybe that, maybe that would actually be the more, the more uh, common situation. Well, there's no sin involved, and it's very good to just submit yourself to the will of another and just do it the other way. Or maybe you know the best way to get a job done, and you're trying to teach your son how to do something. Or maybe, sons, your dad is trying to teach you how to do something, and you, of course you think that you know the best way because you're 12, and you've, uh, you've got you know, the experience to know the best way to do something. And meanwhile, dad, you know, he's talking about the way something was done 50 years ago. But... But it's good to, even if you think you know the best way to do something, there's no sin involved. So just do it the way the other person wants you to. And it's good for you, it's good for you to subject your will to another person, especially one who has a superiority over you. It's, it's good to do so. And so we, we consider that, obviously, Jesus knew the best way to do everything, right? But in his humanity, he still had to learn. That's kind of a mystery that's hard to kind of grasp with our minds. But uh, you can imagine the patience that he had in learning from St. Joseph and the importance of learning from St. Joseph, not only for his own sake, but for St. Joseph's sake. I mean, kids, think of that. When your dad is trying to teach you something, it's, it's very important that your dad is able to hand something on to you. And when you get older, you're going to think, why didn't my dad ever show me anything? Well, because you wouldn't let him. Or you'll think, boy, my dad sure showed me a lot, and I so value that, because it's probably the way his dad showed him, and the way his dad showed him, and I'm passing on something that's been in the family for a long, long time. And as you get older, you'll value those things much, much more. Now, if St. Joseph then 
is a faint yet wonderful reflected image of the infinite authority of the Heavenly Father. Then what we're going to move to next is this idea of the hypostatic union. And I did mention this already, that we have the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God, is one person <coughs> with two natures. So he's not a human person and a divine person. He's one person who's human and divine, both. And that's what we call the hypostatic union, the union of two natures in one person, the union of divinity and humanity in one. So the hypostatic, refunion, the hypostatic union then refers to the union of God and man. We say then that Mary and Joseph belong to the hypostatic order. So the order of the hypostatic union. And this again might be a new concept. Mary and Joseph belong to the hypostatic order because they were instruments in bringing it about that the eternal son of the father should take on human flesh as the fruit of their virginal marriage. They were instruments in that, not physically, but morally, morally and spiritually. And again, we go back to Suarez who writes the following. I do not think it at all improbable that the task or the office of St. Joseph in as much as it belongs in some respect to a higher order can be called more perfect than the office of apostles. For as I understand it, certain offices in the kingdom of God belong to the order of sanctifying grace. And in this order, as I understand it, the apostles ranked highest and needed more extraordinary graces and gifts of wisdom than others did. So we think about that. You know, the apostles who were beginning everything and who are, were closest to the source, they received more extraordinary graces. St. Saint Peter could say, well, I have no silver to, or gold to give you, but I'll give you this. In the name of Jesus Christ, arise and walk. And the guy got up and walked. So St. Peter had that grace. But there are offices that belong, we continue with Suarez here, but there are offices that belong to the order of the hypostatic union, which in, is in its kind more perfect, as I have said when speaking of the dignity of the mother of God. And the mother of God is more perfect than an apostle. Now in this order, though in the lowest place, I find the office of St. Joseph, and thus it excels all offices precisely because it belongs to a higher order. So the office of St. Joseph is of a higher order than the, the apostles. The apostles have extraordinary graces by, um, let's see, the, uh, the apostles belong to the order of sanctifying grace, but Joseph and Mary belong to the order of the hypostatic union. Now, in this order, though in the lowest place, I find the office of St. Joseph, and thus it excels all offices precisely because it belongs to a higher order. Therefore, St. Joseph was careful to state, I'm sorry, therefore St. Thomas was careful to state that the apostles ranked higher than others because their office belonged to the New Testament. But the office of St. Joseph does not belong to the New Testament, nor strictly speaking, to the Old Testament. But the office of St. Joseph belongs to the author of both of them, both the old and new, to the cornerstone who has made both one. It's a wonderful thing to think about. So if you, know, if you think about the most powerful saint to pray to, you know, maybe you have favorite saints to pray to, St. Anthony, maybe you pray to St. Jude, maybe you pray to St. Patrick, or uh, any number of uh, obscure saints um, or popular saints. Maybe uh, we think about praying to Saints Peter and Paul. But really, you know, Saint, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who has um, super veneration, super, uh, what do we call that? Um, you have uh, dulia and uh, hyperdulia, right? So um, we, you, she has a super veneration above all saints. But Saint Joseph, 
you know, St. Joseph may not compare to St. Mary in terms of uh, being immaculate, being um, perfect, but he was put in charge of her. He has authority over her, and he has authority over God himself in the Holy Family. So to pray to St. Joseph of the order of the hypostatic union, we really need to be confident in praying to him. Uh, and any of you who have a devotion to St. Joseph will attest to this. St. Joseph will give you gifts that you don't even ask for. You, you might ask for a little something, and he'll give you this, this big thing that you didn't even ask for. You didn't even think you needed it until you get it, and then you think, wow, this must be from St. Joseph. Thank you, St. Joseph. And you have more confidence to pray to him again and again and again. Well, many of you already know that the devil is terrified of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We spoke about this before. St. John Vianney, again, has said that because she's immaculate, she's invisible to the devil. And that's why when we pray the rosary, that he trembles into parts for fear that she will crush his head. Now, this is due to her being immaculate, but also due to her inclusion in the order of the hypostatic union. Now, St. Joseph, although in the lowest place in the hypostatic order, is included in the order of the hypostatic union. And for this reason, for this reason, our Lord Jesus is obedient to him. So for this reason, also the devil flees in terror from the presence of St. Joseph, who is the terror of demons. I would guess that you've heard some or all of this from Father Calloway today. I was saying Mass and hearing confessions, so I haven't heard his talk. But I know that he is promoting consecration to St. Joseph, and I would definitely recommend that you do so. Uh, I'm sure he gave you all sorts of reasons for doing so. We consecrated the parish of St. Stephen's to St. Joseph last spring, although the previous spring we had consecrated the parish to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And you might, you know, you might think, well, can you consecrate yourself to both? Well, really, consecration to Mary leads to consecration to St. Joseph. I mean, it, uh, Mary is the closest among human creatures to God, but St. Joseph is the next closest. And really, if you think about it, we come, well, we, we come to Jesus through Mary. St. Louis de Montfort says that, you know, God sent us Mary, or God sent us his son, through Mary the first time. Therefore, we will always receive the Son through Mary. But Saint, nobody comes to Mary without going through St. Joseph because he's the head of the Holy Family. So if you want to get to Mary, you have to go through St. Joseph. If you want to get to Jesus, you have to go through Mary. So it follows that if you want to get to Jesus, you have to go through St. Joseph. And for this reason, and many others, we call St. Joseph the patron of the universal church, the patriarch, the father of the universal church. Now, if we think about it this way, the church is the family of God. Therefore, St. Joseph has a special role as the patron or the father of the church. And of course, we understand that he is representing God the Father, and in a lesser way than the Father. But nevertheless, we can turn to him for fatherly help. And it is pleasing to the Eternal Father that we should do so. You know, if, if the Eternal Father gives us St. Joseph as a father, then it would really be an insult to God to refuse to go to St. Joseph. It, and on the other hand, it would be a very pleasing. It would be, you know, a great compliment to God, uh, praising the good work he has done in St. Joseph. All right. Well, let's vouchsafe to return whence we came. You might recall that we began this talk by the entrance of the Holy Family into Egypt. Venerable Mary of Agreda writes that when the Holy family, family reached the inhabited country of Egypt, on entering the towns, the divine infant, in the arms of his mother, he raised his, his eyes and lifted his hands to the Father, asking for the salvation of these inhabitants who were held captive by Satan. And immediately he made use of his sovereign and divine power, and he drove the demons from the idols, and he hurled them to the infernal abyss. 
Like lightning flashed from the clouds, they darted forth and descended to the lowermost caverns of hell and darkness. And at the same instant, the idols crashed to the ground, the altars fell to pieces, and the temples crumbled to ruins. But the demons, although they felt the divine power, they knew not whence this power proceeded. But we know, we know that, that as they looked upon this little family traveling into Egypt, and they saw that little one with a crown upon his head, and even if he didn't physically have a crown, he morally had a crown on his head. And they saw that great big man carrying him and all of his authority and dignity. And the demons must have thought that it was Joseph who drove them out. And I would vouchsafe to say that they still would think that. So let us turn to St. Joseph, the terror of demons. And let us pray now the litany of St. Joseph. And I'm, I apologize, I don't have it in English. We'll, play it, we'll pray it in Latin. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. Christe audinos, Christe exaudinos. Pater de celis Deus, miserere nobis, have mercy on us. Fili redemptor mundi Deus, Misere nobis, Spiritus Sancte Deus, Miserere nobis, Sancta Trinitas Unus Deus, Miserere nobis. The response now will be Ora pro nobis, Sancta Maria, Ora pro nobis, Sancte Joseph, Ora pro nobis, Proles David Inclita, Ora pro nobis, Lumen Patriarcarum, Ora pro nobis, Dei Genetrici Sponse, Ora pro nobis, custos pudice virginis, ora pro nobis, filii dei nutricie, ora pro nobis, Christi defensor sedule, ora pro nobis, alme familiae preses, ora pro nobis, Iosef justissime, ora pro nobis, Iosef castissime, ora pro nobis, Iosef prudentissime, Ora pro nobis, Joseph fortissime, ora pro nobis, Joseph obedientissime, ora pro nobis, Joseph fidelissime, ora pro nobis, speculum patientiae, ora pro nobis, amator paupertatis, ora pro nobis, exemplar opificum, ora pro nobis, Domestice vite decus, ora pro nobis. Custos virginum, ora pro nobis. Familiarum columen, ora pro nobis. Solatium miserorum, ora pro nobis. Spes egrotantium, ora pro nobis. Patrone moriensium, ora pro nobis. Terror demonum, ora pro nobis. Protector sancte ecclesiae, Ora pro nobis. Anius dei qui tolis peccatamundi, parce nobis domine. Anius dei qui tolis peccatamundi, exaudi nos domine. Anius dei qui tolis peccatamundi, miserere nobis. Constituet eum dominum domus sue, et principem omnis possessione sue. Oremus, Deus qui ineffabili providentia beatum Iosef, sanctissime genetricis tuae sponsum elitre dignatus es, prestequesimus ud quem protectorem veneramur in terris, inter cesorem habere meriamur in celis, qui vivis et regnas in saecula saeculorum. Amen. Sancte Iosef, o, protector noster, ora pro nobis. Amen. Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen.